Any children that are here, I invite you to come forward. Hey there, have a seat. Come on over. Good evening. Okay, so if I had a pie here, and I don't, so don't get your hopes up, but if I did, and you had a penny, would you give me a penny for, your, for this pie? Okay, it, it is pie. Okay, so, so yeah, you would. Okay, what if I said, I've got this pie, and if you'd like it, you have to give me your shoes. Hmm, tough call, huh? It is pie after all. No, wouldn't do it, huh? Okay. What if someone went to your parents and said, if you give me your kids, I'll give you this pie. You think, oh, like, hmm, pie. What kind of pie? <laughs> what do you think? Do you think that they would trade you for pie? No. 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 Probably not. Most days. All right. So, what about God? What is God willing, if he wanted you instead of pie, what would he be willing to give up to have you? Yeah. His son. His son, that's right. That's right. And in fact, he, it's not just that he would be willing to give that up. He did. He gave up his son, who, who became a, a person like us, Jesus, and he died on the cross for us. And that's how much God loves us. That's how much he cares about us. That's how much he wants us to be with him forever. He loves us more than pie. He loves us like he loves his son. All right, will you pray with me? Please join us in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me and giving up everything for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming up this evening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So you can tell a lot about a person by the things that they purchase. Uh, not just where you shop, although that tells you a few things, but you can also, just by looking, if I had a list of everything that you've spent money on in the past year, I could tell you all kinds of things about yourself. In fact, those store cards that you have all hanging from your keychain or you know, in your wallet, the whole purpose of those cards is so that the store can find out about you and find out what you like and, and so that they can target advertisement toward you. In fact, there was not too long ago, it was about a year or so ago, uh, there was a woman who started to get in the mail from, I think it was from Target, coupons for things like prenatal vitamins. And she went, why are they sending me these? Well, it turns out she was pregnant and didn't even know it. The store knew before she did just because of some of the things that she had been buying were the sorts of things that women tend to buy before they get pregnant. But what it comes down to is we spend money on the things that we value. If you value having a warm home in the wintertime, then you spend money on natural gas or fuel oil or something to heat your home. If you value being able to communicate with people very easily and quickly and at all times, then you probably spend quite a bit of money on a cell phone contract. Right? And as you think about the things that you spend money on, that shows the things that are important to you. But it's not just your money that shows your values. It's also your time. 
You think about the time that you spend and what you spend it on. If you spend a lot of time at your kid's school, then that shows that you have you value their education or, or, or some aspect of their education that you want to spend time on helping to develop that. And so you think about the various things that you spend time on, and that reflects your values. And now if you take money, you take time and, and, and effort, and another thing that really reflects our values is what we spend time on in training. And so, for instance, I had a conversation with someone last week that, um, that he said, well, computers, you can do almost anything that you want to do on a computer if you know the right combination of keystrokes. It's like four different buttons. You push them all at the same time, one step, boom. And I thought, well, that might be one step at that point. But first, you're memorizing pages and pages of obscure keyboard combinations. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of training that has to go into it before you can actually do that. But he was an IT guy, so that was valuable to him. That was important to him. Me, I don't have the time, or more important, the value, to invest in learning all of those keyboard commands, so it's not important to me. And so I'm not willing to put in time and training into that. You think about the things that you've done that you wanted to learn about, that you, you invest time in, things that you practice uh, so that you can get better at it, and that shows your values too. And so we have all different values. If I took any, any two or three of you and, and took a look at, at your time and, and your money and, and the training that you've done, I could get a sense of your values, but I'll bet if I lined them up, they wouldn't all be the same. And in fact, even where there's similarities, you might spend more or less relatively than others, where you may value some of the same things as other people, you, vary the, you value them to a greater or lesser degree. And so then when we, we think about, okay, so if all of us have different values, which ones are the right ones? Well, it depends on the person, but at the same time, it begs the question, so what does God value? What's important to him? Because if it's important to him, then just maybe it should be important to us. And we should consider that this may be good, sound investment advice if we know what God's values are. And so we see the answer to that question in the gospel lesson that you heard Pastor Stabler reading before, in John chapter 2, the the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. So now understand what was happening here. This was actually, when Jesus walked in, this was business as usual. There were no surprises going on here. All right? It was the Passover, which in, in, the, in the Jewish festival year was like one of the high big festivals of the year. This, and people would come from miles and miles around to come and be a part of this. And so the temple would just be chock full of people. The temple was a huge complex. It was like a fourth or a third the size of the entire city of Jerusalem. And and so it was this massive building, and and it would just be full of people, thousands of people who would come. It was like the the closest thing that we probably have to that is uh, New York Times Square on New Year's Eve. So that's what's going on. You imagine Jesus coming in there, and, and in the outer courtyard of the temple which is also called the Court of the Gentiles. He sees these booths set up. Now, first of all, you have the money changers. Now, these money changers served an important purpose. Most of the people, the the money that they would carry around were Roman coins, because that's what you needed in the Roman Empire. Problem is, he couldn't use Roman coins in the temple. You had to, if you wanted to make a, a financial offering, it had to be in Jewish coins. 
And so they would have to exchange it. The same way if you're going to Europe or some other country, you'd have to exchange your American money for the money of that country. And so you know, the money changes because it's, their, it's a service that they provide. They take a little bit off the top, the same way that if you go to the bank and, and exchange it, you don't get the full value of your money. And it's just the way it is, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right? And then you had all these people with the animals. Right? Now, if you're going to make a sacrifice in the temple, the rule was that this sacrifice had to be a perfect animal, or as perfect as possible. It had to have no spots, no blemishes, no injuries, no noticeable uh, illnesses of any kind. And what many people didn't realize at the time is that pointed to Jesus being the perfect sacrifice for us. But here you have all of these animals, and people would have animals that they could bring with them, but the problem is, is you're traveling on foot to get to Jerusalem, and some of them would be coming from 100 miles away. And so if you imagine trying to travel on, on dirty roads and trying to keep an animal from getting injured or, or you know, getting just overly dirty or something like that, then you're taking a huge risk to try to bring your animal all that way for the sacrifice. And so it made a lot more sense to take some good animals and sell them in your hometown, take the money go to Jerusalem and then buy an animal with that money there that you could guarantee would be in the right condition for the sacrifice. Right? Again, providing a necessary function, a necessary service. But the problem was that these guys were selling these things in the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was, was the outer court. And if you were a Gentile, which is anyone who is not born from a Jewish family, if you wanted to go there and worship, you'd, you'd become a believer in the true God and, and you wanted to go and, and, and participate in that system and, and go and make your sacrifices. You couldn't go any further than the court of the Gentiles just because of who you were born to. And that's the way it was set up. And so you'd go in there and, and, and you'd try to, to worship. And you'd be praying and, and maybe singing psalms and, and things like that. And, but while you're doing that, you've got people behind you going, I've got a sale on sheep! And, you know, and, and money jingling and, and uh, you know, the, the smells of the animals and, and it's just all kinds of distractions. And if you can kind of imagine trying to, to worship like we are tonight, but in the food court at the Mall of America. It would just be so distracting and hard to concentrate, and that's what was going on here. And so we don't see Jesus get riled up and angry very often. All right. Off the top of my head, I, I can think of when they tried to keep the children away from him. You can think of uh, when, when Peter tried to get him to avoid going to the cross. A couple other times, maybe. But not real often. But here, he gets upset. Because these people couldn't worship. Because you see, God values the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean the church like a building. Now, we're thankful that we have this building so we don't have to worship at the food court in the Mall of America. But at the same time, the building is, it, it serves a function, but what God values is the people that gather here. The people that he loves, that's who he values, the church. And, and also not like... Our church, like our organization, the, the committees and the, um, you know, the, the sort of institution. Now also, nothing wrong with that, and it helps us to gather, it helps us to organize and, and things like that, and it's important. But God's primary focus is on the people themselves, on us. Right? And the people that, that would come to gather and worship him in various places. Jesus came to purge the temple, to replace the temple. First, he, he purged the, the temple to, at least in that, in that spot, to free it up for the Gentiles to worship there. 
but ultimately it was to purge our sin. When he made that claim, when, when, he, when he said, that, you know, when he, he um, started turning over tables and all that kind of thing, and they said, hey, by what authority are you doing this? What do you think you're doing? And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up again. And that was pretty scandalous. What are you talking about? Destroy the temple, that's treason. And, I mean, that would, that would, not only would that be uh, just a complete affront to God, but it would also completely uh, destroy the economic system that revolved around it. But also... There's no way that you could rebuild something that took years and years, decades to build, to build it up in three days. Even with all of our modern construction equipment, we couldn't build a complex that size in three days. But what was even more scandalous is what they didn't realize is that he wasn't talking about this stone building. He was talking about his body. You see, the temple, if you would ask a, a Hebrew, where is God? Now, on the one hand, they did believe that God is bigger than the universe. He's everywhere at once. But at the same time, the same way that, that, that we can point to the Lord's Supper and, and point to, say, in that bread and wine, Jesus is truly present there in a way that we don't understand, but that he comes as a blessing to us and that he is, he is present there. They would say, God is in the holiest place, we call the Holy of Holies, in the, the innermost part of the temple. And, and there is the Ark of the Covenant, this golden box, and, and above it is this piece called the mercy seat, and over that, that's where God is. That's where he has come to be with us in a special way. That is where we have the assurance that he is present with us. And so the temple was special because that's where God is. And Jesus was saying, oh, you know where God is? He's right here. Right? He was claiming to be God. And he was saying, destroy this temple, my body, this thing that houses God, and in three days I'm going to raise it up again. They, they didn't realize that he was saying that, or they probably would have tried to kill him right there on the spot. Because that would be blasphemy if it weren't true. But that's exactly what happened. He was destroyed. He was nailed to a cross. He suffered and he died there on our behalf. And in so doing, he purged the temple because he took on all of our impurities, all of our corruption, just like the corruption that was in that, that stone temple. All of our corruption, all of our sin, he took on himself. And just as the temple was the place where sacrifices were made for the forgiveness of sins, so his body was the final, ultimate temple, the place where the sacrifice was made for the forgiveness of our sins. So the stone temple, after Jesus died and fulfilled his prediction to raise up that temple in three days by rising from the dead, so then the old temple was no longer needed. That was no longer the place to go to find God. And in fact, after that, he made us his temple. And so that dwelling in our hearts, he, he promised to come and be with us. And he comes to us through the Holy Spirit and through our holy baptism that he comes and he dwells in us. And so that we now are the temple. We, every Christian, is holy ground. And God dwells with us. And so, because we have been destroyed, we've been buried with him in our baptism, our old sinful self has been destroyed, and then we have been raised up to new life in Christ, we are along with him. We are that same temple that has been destroyed and raised up. But what obstacles are we putting in the way of the Gentiles and their worship? What is keeping other people from worshiping that we're doing? What are the money changers in our actions? 
And sometimes what we do is we invalidate other people's faith. We say, if you have a certain kind of lifestyle, then you can't possibly be a Christian. Because somehow our sins, even our habitual sins, are not quite as bad as that other person's sins. Or, and I don't know, I mean, I have heard this too many times to count. If you belong to such and such political party, and I've heard both directions say this, then how can you call yourself a Christian? You've got to understand, and, and this is with the knowledge that studies have shown that people are more likely to change their religious views than their political views. Political party does not determine someone's faith, and it does not invalidate someone's faith. Pretty much all political parties, there's probably exceptions to this, but pretty much all of them want ultimately the same thing. They want peace, they want stability, they want the best for the citizens of that nation. They just have different ideas about what's the best strategy to get there. And you can argue about who's right and who's wrong about that. But that has nothing to do with someone's faith. And yet, we're willing to question someone's faith because of their political party allegiance. But not only do we invalidate people's faith, we'll prevent people's faith. We get in the way of people's faith through the way that we live our lives. You know, we just sang in, in that song that love so amazing, so divine, demands my, my soul, my life, my all. And yet, how often is that true? How often do we live up to that demand? We can be so shallow about the way that we practice our faith, and we say, well, if I, you know, if I show up for services like about once a week, give or take, and uh, you know, maybe serve on a committee once in a while or something like that, then I'm good. Or like if, you know, if, or if, as long as I do a bunch of stuff on the property of the church, then I can check that off and, and I've done my duty. That's not what the faith is all about. It's completely missing the point. Or, or, or we can just be hypocritical and, and, and we can say that we can think ourselves such, such good Christians and yet as soon as we walk off the property... Our lives don't reflect that. When I was in college, my roommate, who was an atheist, said to me, you know, if I believed what you do, if I believed that God became a human being and went through all of that suffering for me and was willing to die so that I could live forever in joy and and happiness with him, that would change everything. That would change the way that I live. That would change the way that I look at people. That would change everything that I do. If I believe that. But when I look at Christians, I don't see that. I don't see that change. I don't see that attitude. I don't see that reflection in their lives. And so why should I believe that? And I've thought about that question a lot over the years. And I've looked at my own life. He was my roommate. He knew my strengths. He knew my weaknesses. And and I knew that I was guilty of that as much as anybody else. We get these, these subculture expectations. Like if you're a Christian, that, and I'll bet you I can even do this tonight, at, at a contemporary service. The Lord be with you. See? Now, there's probably one or two people here that they go, what just happened? Did I, is this a cult or something? 
And we have these expectations like if you don't worship a certain way, if you don't listen to the right music, if you don't listen to the right radio station, if you don't know all the right jargon, all the right Christian buzzwords, then somehow you can't be a Christian. If you haven't memorized certain amounts of scripture, if you can't recite back certain things, then you can't really call yourself a Christian, as if that's the bar that God uses. And it can make people think, well, I can never do that. And so I guess I can't be a Christian. What if we purged the money changers from our lives? What if whatever is getting in the way of that's in our lives, that's getting in the way of somebody else's worship, that's getting in the way of between them and Jesus, what if we focused on getting rid of that? Both as individuals and the how we interact with people and also as a congregation. What if we really focused and made a point of saying, all right, anything that gets in the way, we need to seriously consider why, why we're doing that and whether it's worth doing. Now, some of those things, even those responses, are beneficial. There's a purpose to them. We have them for a reason. And if they're beneficial, it's okay to keep them as long as we're using them properly and as long as we're careful not to make them obstacles. But we also need to consider whether they are. Both collectively and individually. What if we really focused on that? And so my question for you is how will your week be different this week? What needs purging in the way that you do faith? What needs purging from your life? Is it some kind of hypocrisy in your life that is causing others to look at you and go, there can't be anything to this Christianity thing? Is it it some kind of shallowness that you're just sort of jumping through hoops and going through the motions? Or you're putting hoops in front of other people that that they think, I couldn't possibly be a Christian because I can't figure out how to jump through those hoops when those hoops are not hoops that... God has established? Is it that you're thinking that faith has to be exercised a certain way? See, that's what the Pharisees did. They said, if if you want to be godly, then you have to dot these I's and cross these T's and do it this way and not any other way. Is there an attitude that you have that needs to be adjusted in the way that you see how faith gets exercised and expressed? Think about how different our lives would be if we got rid of those things. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we have adulterous models. We get ideas about that that real church only happens in certain buildings or that it requires a specific language or context that that has to be done a certain way, and that if it's not done that way or something very similar to that, then it's not right. We, We set up these hoops that people have to jump through that you didn't set up. Lord, give us courage in our lives, in our individual lives, and as a congregation to hold on to what is beneficial but to constantly purge anything that gets in the way of your amazing grace and the true message of your love in the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen.